Okay, Bill, your mic is live now. Yep. You can begin whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay. Hi, my name is William Corwin. I'm the federal point of contact for the uh, subtopics on molten salt reactor material NEOP programs for this uh, year. I'm with the Office of Advanced Reactor Technologies. Next slide, please. Um, the work that we are sponsoring is in support of the Office of Nuclear Energy mission areas specifically related to demonstrating advanced non-LWR reactors and specifically is part of the R&D of the Office of Advanced Reactor Technologies to identify and resolve technical challenges supporting detailed design, regulatory review, and deployment of such advanced non-LWR reactors. Next slide, please. Um, there are a number of advanced non-LWR designs that are being developed by industry with a wide variety of coolants, temperatures, and other aspects. These include high temperature gas cooled reactors, a variety of fast reactors, which include both lead and sodium cooled reactors. But what I'm going to be talking about in uh, large part today are the molten salt reactors. And if you take a look at the bottom of the G-graph, you'll see that there are four examples of close to 15 to 20 concepts that are currently being looked at by industrial partners. Um, they use a different set of uh, coolants, uh, temperatures, fuel forms, et cetera. These are the ones by Terrestrial Energy, Terra Power, Elysium, and Kairos. Um, and there are so many concepts out there that rather than try and go into specifics on them, I would refer you strongly to go back and take a look at the websites for the various molten salt reactor vendors as you may put together any proposals that deal with this call, but just to alert you to the fact that there are a number of these reactor vendors that are currently getting into the fray to put these things together. Next slide, please. In general, structural materials are critical for any type of advanced nuclear reactors, but they are particularly critical for the molten salt reactors because of some of the special issues related to corrosion. Um, structural materials have to perform over the desired design lifetimes at the high temperatures for all of the coolant boundaries and various components, things like vessels, piping, and internals, heat exchangers, et cetera. And in addition to working at the high inelastic temperature operating range uh, required for this class of reactors, selection of the construction materials for an advanced molten salt reactor is critically dependent on its unique interactions with coolant and the chemistry of that coolant. Materials compatibility and mass transfer uh, of alloy constituents in a molten salt reactor cooled reactor are major issues. Um, now different construction materials are typically required for any different advanced reactor system, but that's especially true for molten reactor system, molten salt reactor systems. Next slide, please. Now, there are a wide variety of parameters that molten salt reactor systems have that lead to different design characteristics of those different systems. And this view graph sort of summarizes some of the major ones. Uh, first of all, uh, some of the vendors are looking at fast spectrum reactors versus thermal spectrum reactors. Uh, this principally impacts the rate of irradiation damage that occurs in these, as well as the um, highest level of radiation damage that would occur to the various components. Fast spectrum, of course, leading to higher uh, irradiation and larger or have radiation rate and larger radiation damage levels. Uh, the next major difference is whether these reactors are liquid fueled or solid fuel. Liquid fueled in this case means that the coolant actually contains the fuel itself. Um, and so not only would the salt contain the fuel, but it would also contain a wide variety of fission products that result from the um, 
operation of the reactor. And these have a significant impact on the corrosion interactions with the structural materials in which they come in contact. Solid fuel reactors, conversely, uh, typically use triso type particle fuel in a variety of forms. Some people are considering using planks, others are using um, pebbles. It depends upon the specific uh, design of the reactor. And the liquid salt is used only as a reactor medium uh, in terms of cooling. Um, the next major difference in some of these things is what is the type of salt that is being looked at. Um, traditionally, fluoride salts have been used in the um, experiments, major experiments for like the molten salt reactor experiment in Oak Ridge way back when, um, versus chloride salts, which are now being examined by some of the potential vendors. Um, and I'll talk more about the differences and what the interactions are with the various and assorted um, aspects of material interactions of chloride versus fluoride salts in a moment. The last difference is that there are dr dramatically different design lives that some of these vendors are looking at. While many of them are looking at traditional design lives of what we consider 30 to 60 year kind of design lives, um, there is a small subset that have so many issues they're looking at with their particular um, molten salt reactor systems that they are willing to almost, and this is probably a tough thing to say, but make the material sacrificial in the sense that they are willing to have very short live design systems where they will are willing to use some of the existing ASME materials as they are and accept the relatively high corrosion levels, leading to fairly short design lives, four to seven kinds of year, four to seven a year type of design lives. Um, for the purposes of discussion today, I will be focusing more on the traditional design lives of 30, 40 to 60 kind of year type of designs. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at research for. Next to graph, please. Now, the types of materials that are available for construction of molten salt reactors, for that matter, any of the high temperature reactors are the same as they have been for quite some time. They are those that are uh, qual qualified within ASME Section 3, Division 5. These include the two stainless steels, 304 and 316, alloy 800, which is a high alloy. Uh, both two and a quarter chrome and nine chrome one molly steels. And I will include alloy 617. It's not quite approved yet, but it's right on the cusp and should be available for use in the very near future. It's a nickel based alloy, higher strength, but without quite the radiation resistance that a lot of some of the other materials have. And it's also got cobalt in it. So it's probably a very poor choice for in core type of applications, though heat exchangers and whatnot would be very good. However, none of these materials are really optimal for molten salt reactor applications because none of them contain the combination of high temperature strength, corrosion resistance, and neutron radiation resistance that would be ideal for molten salt reactors. Hence, we've got a couple of these NIFs that are we're putting out for you all to look at and see if we can come up with some alternatives. Now let me talk for a minute next year, Graham, on the difference of corrosion of structural materials in the different classes of coolants being fluoride salts versus chloride salts. Now, molten fluoride salts, which there is a much broader base experience in, fluorides remove the oxide layers from metals, just like a welding flux or a, uh, um, a soldering flux. They just completely strip the oxide layers off and leave the metal just bare. This, the oxide high temperature uh, oxide layer that forms in most environments provides oxidation protection uh, in the classic sense for structural materials in almost all environments, and this is not there. As a result, there's a number of things that can readily happen in high temperature structural alloys in a fluoride salt situation that are not common in other situations. Mass transfer, 
um, due to thermal and or chemical gradients um, between different portions of the uh, primary circuit uh, where one can actively selectively dissolve components of the alloys and then either just dissolve them into the coolant or actually redeposit them elsewhere in the circuit uh, is possible within molten salt reactors. An example of this is the selective dissolution of chromium near the alloy surface and long grain boundaries in chromium bearing alloys. This is one of the reasons why Hasloy N was developed with relatively low chrome. You get down below the activity level where chrome relatively readily dissolves into the coolant. However, other things can readily happen without this protective layer. For instance, intergranular stress corrosion cracking has been observed in Hasloy N. Uh, due to the fission product of uh, tellurium that exists in uh, molten salt uh, reactors. And in general, corrosion is accelerated by the presence of impurities. Um, so the redox control and general corrosion, um, sorry, impurity control in these uh, salt-based, fluoride salt-based systems is important with regard to corrosion resistance of the materials. By comparison, uh, in chloride salt uh, systems, oxide layers can form on the metal surfaces at these kind of temperatures, but on the mostly, in the most most cases, they are porous and they are not protective. They're not the tightly adherent um, layers that we count on for oxidation protection. So the formation of a stable passivating oxi oxide layer is a challenge in these chloride systems, and you can end up with corrosion due to depletion of chromium in the oxide matrix underneath, intergranular corrosion, and the same types of issues that um, I was talking about for fluoride systems in terms of mass transfer and whatnot. Um, in general, nickel-based alloys have a higher corrosion resistance than the stainless steels, but they tend to be more susceptible to irradiation damage, as is typical. In addition, there have been very few studies on the effects of actinides and fission products on the materials corrosion in the chloride salt systems. Next slide, please. Um, I've included a generic slide with regard to irradiation uh, effects. It's hard to be specific because there are so many different uh, dose rates and um, dose levels to which the different components are likely to go from the different reactors. I refer you again back to the websites for the different designers. But just to bring to your attention, specifically for those of you who are interested in RC 1.2 on developing new materials, um, to be cognizant of the fact that radiation damage is important in these molten salt reactor systems. And you can just take a look and see that different types of radiation damage occur at different temperatures, at different uh, doses and whatnot. And you can take a look at the paper by Zinkel and Sneed or the plethora of other information in the literature with regard to that. But it's you have to assess the potential for radiation damage in molten salt reactors as you go forward with this. All right, next slide, please. So getting down to specifics, we have two different subtopic areas that we'd like to look at, like for you guys to look at, with regard to supporting both near-term and longer-term needs for structural materials for molten salt reactors. The first of these, RC 1.1, deals with down-selecting of cladding materials for structural components in liquid-fueled molten salt reactors. And this would be to support nearer-term molten salt reactor deployment. The second topic area, RC 1.2, deals with development of innovative new alloys for molten salt reactor structural applications, and that would be to support the longer term uh, deployment of molten salt reactors. And we recognize it would be longer term because in addition to the development of the alloy and the laboratory uh, demonstration of those alloys, there is the step to commercialization and eventually to code qualification, and that's a long pathway. Since we have these two different topical 
areas, one for the nearer term and one for the longer term um, development of materials uh, in support of molten salt reactors. Next few graphs, please. Um, with regard to RC 1.1, the cladding, what we are interested in you guys doing is to conduct R&D to develop new design rules and analysis methods for integrity of the cladding, its corrosive corrosion protective functions for the structural cladded components for the anticipated service lifetimes conditions for the various molten salt reactors. Initially, the focus on this would be looking at weld overlay fabrication methods. Eventually, this might extend to other possible fabrication methods like roll bonding or whatever. Um, the interest would be to develop and incorporate construction rules into the ASME code, things such as acceptance criteria, uh, the materials that would be used for the cladding, design rules, fabrication methods, pre-service examination techniques for cladding components, and this would again go into ASME section 3, Div 5. Those are the rules that ASME has recently issued for high temperature reactors, uh, construction materials, uh, as well as for the in-service inspection procedures that are contained in ASME section 11. And these would be to support relatively near-term MSR deployment. Um, the reason that we're interested in doing this is to provide MSR designers with some kind of type of code compliant cladding base metal combination that could be utilized for vendor specific molten salt reactor designs without the need for the very long term data generation that would be required for qualifying a new material. So that's uh, RC 1.1. Next few graph, please. Some of the considerations that would be required for uh, cladded components. Um, I'll break those down into three different regions. One, the clad itself. You need to clearly have a clad that is compatible with the uh, uh, salt that's being examined, fluoride or chloride or both, whichever you guys choose to look at. That the irradiation resistance and embrittlement due to fission products um, in the um, clad layer is sufficient that it is weldable onto the materials that are currently approved in Section 3, Div 5, and that it has the ability to maintain a, both a good ductility and a low strength for the design lifetime. And I say low strength because the cladding layer is designed to provide corrosion protection, not strength, very much in the same way that the clad layer on the inside of a a uh, light water reactor vessel provides corrosion and crud pr protection on the inside of reactor pressure vessel for a light water reactor vessel. Um, the main strength that would be provided would be from the base metal in this uh, molten salt reactor. Then moving on to the fusion, fusion zone between the clad and base metal, you need to make sure that the clad material is highly weldable to the uh, base metal chosen that we understand what the mechanical interactions would be between the clad and base metal, things like pre, pre fatigue, stress relaxation, et cetera, as well as what the metallurgical interactions would be, whether it be formation of any brittle phases, what the diffusion might be due to compositional gradients, et cetera. And then lastly, that whatever the base metal chosen would be, um, that it has adequate high temperature strength for design lifetime, most of these systems are designed to operate in the 650 to 750 C kind of temperature range. So you need to look at the uh, appropriate material for that kind of temperature range of those available within ASME section 3 div 5. And that it would have adequate, adequate radiation resistance and that would be specifically to the design of the various vendors that are looking at these things. All right, next you graph please. So to summarize the uh, work on RC 1.1, we're looking for proposals to down select a collection of existing alloys or develop new, collect, uh, new classes of alloys that could be applied as internal clads by using weld overlay for structural components in both thermal and fast spectrum MSRs using liquid fuels. 
and the characteristics that we're looking for would include but are not limited to ductility, compatibility with the different fuel salts, radiation damage resistance, fusion product embrittlement resistance, and weldability on the ASME Div 5 base metals. We encourage the use of innovative scoping techniques with integrated computational methods to accelerate the down selection process. In other words, not the old Edisonian approach, let's use modern material science. And as part of the deliverables, plans should be developed for future intermediate term testing to confirm in whatever favorable characteristics that you observe during the relatively short time frame of the NEA projects that may be required to close any gaps that might exist thereafter. And lastly, while it's not required, uh, it's fairly obvious interaction with any of the MSR designers um, would be highly encouraged with regard to their system requirements. All right, talk briefly about the second of these topic areas, RC 1.2, which is the development of innovative alloys to support the long-term molten salt reactor development. You recognize that the CLAD component concept supports near-term deployment because it removes the significant long lead efforts needed to code qualify new materials, but that it may not be optimum and may have lifetime restrictions. Moreover, construction of components without cladding may very well be preferable from an engineering perspective. So to use a cladded component to support near-term deployment may open up a window of opportunity in the near term development of a, of a new material that is both corrosion resistant with a high temperature strength that's needed uh, may very well meet the requirements of MSRs for nth of a kind insertion. So we are also very interested in that. Next slide, please. So what we are interested in under RC 1.2 is for you guys to develop proposals to develop new metallic alloys that can be used for welded construction of structural components of thermal or fast spectrum MSRs that use liquid fuel. The characteristics of these new alloys should include but not be limited to high temperature strength, fuel salt compatibility, resistance to radiation damage and vision product embrittlement. They should be weldable and they should operate for the desired lifetime of the components. Again, we're looking for novel application of high value experiments with integrated computational materials engineering, in other words, modern day material science. Uh, we certainly would consider non-traditional alloys such as high entropy alloys that would meet the requirements. And while it's not specifically part of this activity, it should be recognized that the long-term goal of any of the alloys developed under this effort would be their eventual qualification for nuclear service under ASME Section 3 Div 5. And hence, uh, their, their long-term stability, fabricability, and potential capability for commercialization are all considered to be important. And lastly, again, while not required interaction with molten salt reactor uh, designers on their system-specific requirements is highly encouraged. Next slide. Uh, the points of contact for these activities, I already mentioned I am the federal point of contact and my contact information is listed. The technical points of con technical point of contact for both of these activities is Dr. Sam Sham at the uh, Argonne National Laboratory and his information is provided there. Those are all my prepared remarks, but I would be glad to answer any questions that may be submitted. Okay, I'm gonna unmute Sam Sham's mic so that Sam can join us for questions this morning. Sam, can you hear us? Uh, yes, uh, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Thank you. Okay, first question, which is multi, has multi parts. The first one is, will there be more than one three-year award each totaling $800,000 for RC 1.1 and RC 1.2? I will field that one. Um, that's always a good question. We hope that there will be, but that will be dependent upon the overall budgets. Uh, in, historically, we have had one to three awards in these materials categories, but it will be de budget dependent for next year. 
Um, can DOE or some other government lab be a sub subcontractor on the grant led by a university? I think that that was addressed in the last topic area. Typically, if, um, non university partners can receive up to 20% of the award. Drew, correct me if I'm mistaken on that. Yep, that's correct, Bill. Okay, uh, will data sets with pertinent thermophysical properties and chemistry of the currently used alloys be provided by DOE? No, but they are relevant, they can be readily obtained from the uh, ASME code. Okay, is the objective strictly to consolidate existing databases and implement data mining, or does it also include design and experimental verification of new chemical compositions of alloys having multiple properties optimized? Um, let me break that down into each of the two topical areas, and then Sam, you can jump in on this as well. Um, in both cases, for the cladding and for the long-term alloy development, um, for the cladding, uh, it can we could consider using existing materials, everything from pure nickel to some of the um, molten salt compatible materials that have been developed over time. Hastelium might be an example um, to anything new that people could come up with that might be appropriate. For the new alloys, again, they could be variations on materials that have been used before or brand new uh, materials. I know of work at some organizations where they've developed uh, some of the uh, HEA alloys that are, tend to have both higher strength and higher corrosion resistance for um, molten salt service. So it would depend upon what people wanted to do. We're not looking strictly for data mining. We're looking for people to go on out and uh, come up with uh, engineering solutions. Uh, if that includes uh, development of new materials, that would be good. Sam, you want to offer anything additionally? Uh, yes, uh, Bill. Uh, for RC 1.1, I want to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, the clad are not wrought metals. Uh, we are interested in the well metals uh, performance in terms of the salt compatibility. Okay. Um, next question. Are you looking for a very comprehensive proposal which tries to cover all the aspects of interest for a material to be used in MSR or a more specific one which may only cover a few topics such as high temperature strength study or ir irradiation damage study or con corrosion study? Um, I would say that we would be interested in something that covers adequately all of the topical, all of the uh, parameters that are important for use. Um, they could focus perhaps more on one than the other, but the greatest challenge that we seem to see in this class of reactors is coming up with a material that is adequately corrosion resistant. For, we have materials that work in the high temperature strength range and that are adequately irradiation resistant um, for these classes of materials, for these classes of reactors, excuse me. But to do that at the same time as having adequate corrosion resistance for the uh, molten salt, we don't have that right now. And so if you can't come up with something that hits all three points of the compass, it doesn't quite get there. So it has to be at least reasonably comprehensive, even if there's a one focus area within the proposal. Uh, does this cover refac refra refractory metals for clad and base metal? Um, refractory metals are a possibility, but in both cases, 
Uh, I mentioned something about the fact that we are interested in having these things meet the rules for the ASME code. Right now, and Sam, you know more about the code than I do, but it's a little tough to get those uh, included for ASME codification. Can you comment on that, Sam? Um, in terms of RC 1.1 for declaring material, uh, I think that uh, one of the promising materials that are uh, refractory, like uh, uh, molybdenum, uh, will be a, a candidate uh, because that it has a uh, 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 good um, uh, properties in terms of the uh, salt resistance. So yes, and for 1.2, probably that uh, in terms of a using a uh, refractory metal as a construction material it will be a little bit challenging. On the because other hand, air, air, had, air oxidation, et cetera. On the other hand, if it were a constituent in a high entropy alloy, Oh yes, of course. That yeah. that would prob that would probably work very well because for HEAs, it's almost essential to get a wide range of of atomic constituents to make them work. Yeah, yeah, that's right. For the near term down selection, which materials are more favored, code qualified or non code qualified alloys? We don't have a restriction. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, we know that qualified material, uh, well, um, they are not very good in terms of the uh, salt corrosion. That's why that uh, we want to have uh, uh, a cladding to serve as uh, uh, to serve the protection function. Okay. Do these include ceramics, glasses, composites, with or without claddings? No. We're looking for ductile materials, metallic materials. For RC 1.1, could the clad be applied using an additive manufacturing technique such as lens? Perhaps as a, a longer term approach, but I think in the short term we're looking for something that can be done as a weld overlay. Sam, you had an yes. initial comment on that? Yes, I think that uh, it is uh, for the uh, deployment in terms of fabrication scale up. Uh, so therefore that um, uh, we have a lot of experience in terms of uh, well overlaid uh, in a petrochemical industry. And, uh, but uh, if there are some innovative uh, additive manufacturing process that can be demonstrated as is scalable, I'm sure, uh, we'll be interested to look into that. How many proposals are you planning to fund in these two topics? We've already addressed that. If part of the proposed work will unavoidably require the use of DOE user facilities not within NSUF, which requires submission and approval of individual and user proposals, how will that affect the review of the NEUP proposal? I think that the NEUP proposals will be reviewed on their own merit. Um, I'm not quite sure how the um, joint review with user facilities would be required. Drew, can you help us with that? Uh, yeah, Bill, I can. The, the user facilities that don't belong to NSUF, um, essentially the answer to the question is, that you should not rely upon any other application that has to be made for the successful completion of your own work. So what you're proposing should be uh, completely achievable and attainable uh, without depending on applications from other funding sources. Now there are cases where those uh, funding sources or those user facilities uh, have already been approved and obtained and if that's the case, they can be explained and included in the proposal. But if the intention is to submit an NEUP proposal, that will then possibly get user access at a later point in time. 
uh, the project should not be dependent on that user access. For RC 1.1 near-term research, by cladding, do you mean a thin coating to provide corrosion resistance? Um, I'm glad that that, some, that question was raised. We're specifically not interested in thin coatings. Um, and thin versus thick is probably a relative term, but we're looking for something that is more traditionally applicable to weld overlay cladding. Uh, those typically are at least a tenth of an inch and more commonly two to three tenths of an inch thick. Uh, thin coatings, uh, things that may be applied such as um, a cold spray or um, other types of coatings that are um, microns thick or fractions of millimeters thick do not fall into the area of interest for this proposal for multiple reasons. One, they tend to be adherent versus metallurgically bonded. They tend to strip, peel, flake. Um, they are too thin to provide the, corro the uh, diffusional barrier that is required for um, usage for proper metallurgical protection. Um, so in general, we are not going to consider any type of thin coatings. I believe that was express, expressly included in the language in the, uh, um, in the call. So that's why we call out weld overlay cladding as the preferable method. Thin coatings are not to be included in proposals. Okay, Bill and Sam, those are the, the final questions that we had. Thank you for staying on a little bit later than your time and answering those. Uh, this concludes the CINR FY 2018 webinar. Uh, thank you for all taking the time to attend. And I would just want to remind you quickly that all of the materials that have been presented here over the last three days will be available on NEUP.gov within two weeks of this webinar. That includes a technical question and answer document. If you have questions about this webinar, about general questions for NEUP, uh, please point those directions toward NEUP at INL.gov, or you can use the technical points of contact section of the NEUP website under the R&D and IRP tabs to find technical points of contact that can help you with development of your technical proposals. Thank you.